I don't know if you've ever gone up to the cashier and paid with cash, because maybe you had some cash in your wallet and you didn't want to use your card. Maybe you were at Macro on a Saturday morning, and as you paid that cash over, you were maybe quite offended, and I felt that way, because the cashier started to examine your notes to see if they were counterfeit. Ever had that experience? And maybe the cashier started to hold it up to the light, you know, to kind of look for the watermark and tilted it slightly to see the kind of the hologram, you know, and uh, started flicking it with her finger to, to test the quality of the money. And uh, I don't know about you, but I always feel a little bit judged in that moment. I think, you know, did I just get picked? I walked up here, maybe I looked like a counterfeiting criminal kind of guy. Um, either, you know, was it the way I was dressed? Did I look too slick or not too slick? What was it? But anyway, I've been picked. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think I'd be hugely shocked and embarrassed. I don't even know what would happen. Maybe the manager would take me to the back room. They'd call the cops. If it it was discovered that all the cash in my wallet was counterfeit. And so this morning, we come to what I think is Jesus' most disturbing parable. Last week was the, the most difficult to understand. This one's not necessarily difficult to understand, but it is very sobering and very disturbing. And we've called this series Parable Stories That Read Us, and the parable this morning is going to read us by holding up our faith in the light of Christ's coming. And it's going to test whether our faith is genuine or whether our faith is counterfeit. And the reason that a counterfeit note can fool us is because it looks so close to the real thing. Nobody's fooled by a note that, that was sort of forged on some cheap photocopier and they, it's all pixelated, you know, and there's, there's kind of a, a, some picture of popcorn on the one side and some strange smudging on the other and just, it just doesn't look like the real thing. It's not, not going to fool us. It's those, like those counterfeit goods that say Abidas instead of Adidas or whatever it is. It's just, it just doesn't fool us. It's patently obvious. And a hypocrite can not only fool other people really well. If we're honest, we can be hypocrites and we can fool ourselves this morning. And that's what's so sobering that you might be here this morning and not even be aware that you could be a false convert. But nobody can fool Christ on the day that he returns. And so as this parable reads you, like me at the cashier, you might feel judged, you might feel offended, you might begin to get angry, you might say, how dare the preacher even suggest that my faith may not be genuine. But the preacher you have a problem with is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he would rather have you offended and then repent Because there would be irreversible consequences if you were lost in your sin than for you to just be deluded into a false sense of security. We need to realize that grace is encouraging, but for grace to be grace, it also has to warn us. We warn those we love. It's because of our love that we warn them, and it's because of Christ's love that he gives us this parable so that we would repent and be ready. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. It's on page 26. Matthew chapter 25, and this takes place in a longer discourse about um, Christ's second coming. There's so much here. There's a whole number of parables crammed together, and they all kind of add to the picture, but I'm not going to give you so much the context as just unpacking this parable in its own right. Matthew 25 from verse 1, page 26, and this parable is called the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Let's read. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, 
And your translation might say, sir, sir. The old NIV says, sir, sir. In the Greek, it is the same word for Lord. So we need to go with what the Greek says. Lord, Lord, they said. Open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. May God use his word to pierce our souls and and, and get us to examine ourselves. Wedding processions in New Testament times involved mainly the groom. That's where the center of attention was focused. It wasn't focused on the bride, it was focused on the groom. And I think we should go back to biblical times because I've got two daughters and I know that one day when they get married it's gonna be hectically expensive and those dresses and all that we focus on. I think let's just focus on the groom, let him pay all, do all everything and, and, and they hold back. That's biblical. But here we see it was about the groom's arrival, not the bride's. Now, we don't know everything that there is to know about wedding culture. It differed through the centuries. So what it was in the second century might not be what it was here. And it differed from town to town and family and customs and so on. But there are a few things we can see from this passage and that we know from historical background. That the bridesmaids would go to the bride's home and they would wait there. And they would attend to her and they'd be waiting for the bridegroom, the groom to arrive. And it's interesting that we read nothing in this parable about the bride herself. The focus, Jesus' focus in this parable is on the ten virgins. And a virgin simply describes a young girl of marrying age. So let's not read too much into that word. That's simply just a young girl. It was a common word used in those days. So the friends of the bridegroom would have all, uh, friends of the, the bride would have all been unmarried. They would have been close friends. And there they are, ten of them, waiting with her as they wait for the groom. We know from the text and from the background that often there might be a long wait. We think labola is something new, but uh, the bride price had to be settled. There could be a lot of arguing and negotiation that took place uh, at the groom's home as the families wrestled over the prices and deals and, and, and only once things had been paid and signed and sealed, only then could the groom make his way to the bride's home. And then, Once he had met the bridal party, they begin this procession through the streets, probably back to his parents' home, because most young grooms didn't have the means to purchase their own home, and so for the first little while, while they they found their feet as a married couple, they probably live in the groom's home with his parents. Can't think of anything worse. (laughs) But anyway, verses five and six tell us that the bridegroom was a long time in coming. In fact, we read in verse six that he only came at midnight. That was probably even later than would have happened in that culture and in a day and age without electricity, people would have been long asleep and we read that this was so late that all the girls, part of the bridal party, waiting for the groom to come when the negotiations had been finished, became drowsy and fell asleep. Now we need to understand that it was also the bridesmaid's responsibility to light the way for the procession. And without light, the procession couldn't happen. And so we often picture that they took these kind of little oil lamps with a little wick and these small things, but that wouldn't have cut it. You needed something majorly bright. And so what's actually being referred to here as lamps are are more like torches, long poles with with rags on the end that would be soaked in olive oil and these flaming torches. And so because they gave off so much light, they consumed huge amounts of oil. And I believe they'd last maybe only about 15 minutes. And then you'd have to dip it in oil, pour more oil on to replenish it. And if the lights went out and if you forgot to bring oil, the, the procession couldn't happen. This was a serious social blunder. And so for anyone to forget the oil, I think in in modern terms, would be like the groomsmen, not only forgetting the rings, but losing them. Losing them. And I'm a pastor, I could keep you here for hours telling you about wedding stories and crazy things that have happened. Maybe it's it's as scandalous as the pastor forgetting to rock up. Someone told me a few weeks ago of a friend of theirs that got to the venue and it was somewhere far out, and when they phoned the pastor, he had forgotten. So... uh, yeah, it, it, it really can't go ahead. What a social blunder. It wasn't me, by the way. That was, really was a friend of mine, not me. But in verse two, we told that five of the bridesmaids were foolish and five were wise. And this is the point that Jesus is making. At this point in the story, we cannot tell which five are wise and which five are foolish. They look the same. 
they dress the same, they got the same makeup on, they smell the same, they're in the same place, they're there for the same reason. So how do we know? And that's the point that Jesus wants us to see. And so I want to begin by asking how were they all similar? I think it's a good question and I've been helped by two commentators in particular as I've crafted this, this list. And if we were in a Bible study, I'd say, so what are all the ways that f- the foolish bridesmaids and the wise ones were the same? Well, here's my list. Number one, they were all invited. None of them could say that they were unprepared for the groom's coming because hey, we didn't get an invite. I didn't know it was there, it went to the spam folder, why didn't you phone me? They had all been invited and all had the privilege of receiving the invitation. Number two, they all accepted the invitation, at least outwardly for some of them. They all said, yes, we'll be there. What a great occasion. I can't think of anything better. Yeah, we'll be there. And if you flip back to the parable of the wedding banquet, just three chapters back in Matthew chapter 22, when that wedding invitation went out, what happened? It says that those who were invited refused to come. The invitation goes out a second time and they just ignore it. They go back here and they carry on with their work and go back to farming. But here, all of these had accepted the invitation. So outwardly they were saying yes. Outwardly they were saying yes in some sense. I'll, 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 I'll come to church. I, 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 I want to be here. Thirdly, we see they all got involved. They're all part of the bridal party. They all seem ready. They all want to participate. We might even say they all want to be involved at Rosebank Union Church. But we know that old saying that just because you sit in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in your garage will make you a car. Both the wise and the unwise seem very committed. They committed to church life, church membership. They've been through the waters of baptism. Some of them are elders, some of them are deacons, maybe some of them are pastors. They get excited, they come to worship, they raise their hands, they're part of with the proceedings that are happening. Commitments are good. Jesus is not saying commitment is not good, but he's saying commitment cannot save us. Commitment cannot save us. And a hypocrite can be just as committed as a true believer. In fact, sometimes a hypocrite can be even more committed than a true believer. Think of the Pharisees. They outshine all of us in their devotion, in their tithing, in their giving, in their morality. And then think of Judas. It's very sobering when Jesus said, tonight, one of you will betray me. The disciples didn't go, of course, we we know it's Judas. I mean, he's got the sign betrayer written on his shirt. Why did he have that t-shirt made? We, We knew it was him. He's the one that's not as committed as us. I mean, he doesn't listen to Jesus. We can see he's dozing off during the sermons. Uh, No, Judas was there with them. They all turned inward and said, surely not I, Lord, surely not I, because they never saw anything in Judas's outward behavior that would have made them suspect that he was a hypocrite. In fact, they said, he's the most responsible of us. Let's make him the treasurer. Let's give him all the money. That's what's sobering. But number four, they all have a general affection for the bridegroom. All 10 virgins wanna go out and, and meet and see the bridegroom. We don't read that they spoke badly of him. They seem to have some kind of love, at least an outward fondness towards him. Many people can love the Christian faith. Maybe they went to a Christian school. Maybe they grew up in a Christian family. Maybe when they were teenagers, they had Christian friends. So it takes a lot of courage to say as an adult, now I'm just gonna reject that. And so you come to church. You're involved in the life. You have a general affection for the bridegroom. You love the, the poetry of scripture. As literature goes, it's beautiful. You love Shakespeare. You love the Bible. You love the social atmosphere, you, you, you get fellowship here, you love that we serve the poor, you get to be part of an organization that meets the needs of the poor, you can go on missions trips, holiday clubs, you, you enjoy sermons as a form of entertainment, you say this is great, it's, it's helping me in my life. But friends, I want you to see that none of these things are guarantees that you're truly saved. Number five, even more sobering is that they all call the bridegroom Lord. They all utter those words. They don't use that word as a curse word. They call him Lord. It's very sobering. They call him Lord twice. Look later in the parable. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. And the question I have, and this is what sobered me this week, is how can somebody be so close to Christ, almost as though they're pleading for the door of heaven to open, almost as though they're saying the sinner's prayer, but yet miss out? 
I think the disciples must have thought back to chapter seven. We're in chapter 25, rewind the clock, they must have thought chapter seven of Matthew seven, perhaps the most sobering words in all of scripture, Matthew seven twenty one. Jesus said again to his disciples, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, there are the two words again, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. And then number six, they all believe the bridegroom is coming. You can't fault their doctrine. They believe in the second coming. They believe all the right things, but so what even the demons believe the right things. The demons sometimes believe with more orthodoxy than you do, and they tremble. But even that's not a guarantee that they are ready. Number seven, they all have lamps. They're all equally equipped. None of them can say, oh, I, I, I was disadvantaged. I, didn't get, I, I don't have a lamp. That's why I'm not ready. They all had the proper equipment. They all had the tools of the faith like you and I do. We have the Bible. We have church. We have worship services. We can even have outward works of morality. And that's how tricky counterfeit faith can be. Even false converts can live outwardly like a Christian, and have good works, even experience something of the Holy Spirit. We can be in a worship service and say, I was moved in some way. We can hear a sermon as a hypocrite and and feel conviction. Our conscience can bother us. God has put that, that warning light in us, and so we can feel all of those things, and the Holy Spirit can seem, even seem to work on such a person, but not in them. And the book of Hebrews even talks about it, those who've tasted and have been enlightened and there's been some sort of spin-off from social Christianity that we've picked up from the person worshiping next to us, but it may not be genuine for us. We're just kind of doing what we're supposed to do. So they all have lamps, and then the eighth and final similarity I see is that they all fall asleep waiting. Nowhere do we read that anyone was condemned for falling asleep. Waiting for Christ's coming doesn't mean that we put our normal routines and daily things on hold. I'm sure you remember around the Y2K when the millennium flipped over to 2000 and we thought that the clocks of the computers were going to crash the entire world. Some people in the US ran to the hills. They stocked up on canned peas and lived in a bunker and ran to the hills. The way we wait for Jesus' coming is not that way. They slept, that was natural. Remember when we did theology of ordinary life, sleep, drink, these things are are gifts from God and we don't just stop daily life and routine. The wise bridesmaids were able to sleep soundly because they'd done everything necessary to prepare themselves so they could sleep. When he comes, we've got everything here, where's the oil, where's we sorted and off they went to sleep. But the foolish, Bridesmaids, they were also able to sleep soundly and their reason for sleeping soundly is because they were completely oblivious to their lack of preparation. So it's not true that only true Christians can sleep well. Many sleep well in our society deluded into a false security which one day will lead to a wake up call and a realization that they are not ready. So you can see how heavy this is as I've prepared and as I've searched my heart, but I have to be faithful to God's word. I wish there was a way to minimize this and make it lighthearted and more humorous, but but as as I look at this, this is sobering. And Jesus is saying to us this morning, watch out, the wise and the foolish look very much alike. It's possible for you to do all of these things and still be unprepared. Let me recap them. They all were invited. They all accepted the invitation. They all got involved. They all had a general affection for the bridegroom. They all call him Lord. They all believe he's coming. They all have lamps and they all fall asleep. So they look similar except for one distinguishing characteristic. What is that one singular difference between a true believer and a hypocrite? What is it? We need to be able to answer that so that we can be ready. Look at verses three and four. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. 
Jesus doesn't tell us explicitly, explicitly here what the oil is, but I, I think we can't read this and miss the fact that the oil is a picture of an inward reality. The oil is a picture of true conversion. The oil may even be a picture of the Holy Spirit who's described as oil throughout the scriptures, the indwelling power and influence of the Holy Spirit working in us, not just on us. And the Apostle Paul says that in the last days, people will have a form of godliness but deny its power. In other words, you can have a form of godliness, the lamp, but you can deny the very fuel that was meant to fire it. And without the fuel to empower the lamp, the lamp is useless. No matter how great the lamp looks, we need both the lamp and the oil to be able to bring light. You need both faith and works. Faith without works is dead, but if you don't have works, you you might not have faith, but you can have works and may not be a Christian. And so there's a danger. If you say you have faith, it must demonstrate itself in the lamp blazing. But you can have a lamp and not have the reality. And then that lamp will not last. Look at verse eight. The foolish one said, our lamps are going out. Why? Because without true conversion, you can only manufacture good works for a short period of time but they won't be sufficient to save you. And I think back on my years of ministry, people who've served alongside me, even some pastors I know who were colleagues in ministry and interns who've turned their back on God and walked out of the church because their their good works couldn't sustain them because they were done without the fuel of the gospel. They got tired of their performance being on this treadmill. I can't keep up Christianity anymore. It's too hard. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be impossible because you're supposed to have the oil. And so these young virgins lit these rags, but these rags had never been soaked in oil. And so there was the appearance of light, there was the appearance of, hey, the procession's gonna start, but those rags just shriveled up because there wasn't oil. No oil to sustain them. Their good works were insufficient to honor the groom or sustain the procession, and that was the whole point. Because we need to be born again. We need a new nature. We cannot manufacture this. We need to be changed from within. The parable is written to the disciples. It is written to the church. So it's not for outside people. It is for this gathering. And Jesus is saying, for revival to come, it starts in the church. Revival is when hypocrites in the church who've been living half-hearted lives say, I'm not ready and I need to repent and get ready. That's what brings revival and that then begins to change people outside. Charles Spurgeon on this parable said, a great change has to be wrought in you, far beyond any power of yours to accomplish before you can go in with Christ to the marriage. You must first of all be renewed in your nature or you'll not be ready. You must be washed from your sins or you'll not be ready. You must be justified in Christ's righteousness. You must put on his wedding dress or else you'll not be ready. You must be reconciled to God or you'll not be ready. You must have a lamp and that lamp must be fed with heavenly oil and it must continue to burn brightly or else you will not be ready. No child of darkness can go into that place of light. You must be brought out of nature's darkness into God's marvelous light or else you will never be ready to go in with Christ to the marriage and to be forever with him. So what do we learn from this parable? There's a few things, and I, again, I want to just give you my, my list as you see the full weight of, of, of God by his spirit almost kind of just turning the screws into us as we, as we feel the weight of what it means to be ready. So what do we learn? We learn, first of all, that the coming of the bridegroom reveals our true state. Look at verse six. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And the thing that shocks me is that the lost, the unwise are surprised. They weren't expecting this. They are absolutely surprised. They never saw it coming. They knew the groom was coming, but they never saw their unreadiness. They never realized their true predicament. And one Bible commentator says, all 10 are expecting to be at the feast, And until the moment comes, there is no apparent difference between them. It is the crisis which will divide the ready from the unready. And sometimes God brings those little crises into our lives long before his coming, suffering. Suffering sometimes separates sheep from goats, the next parable. 
That seed that was sown in the good soil and the seed that was sown in the shallow soil, they look exactly the same as they grow up. The same sun comes out and what happens? The same sun that causes the seed in the good soil to blossom and flourish is the same sun that causes the seed in the shallow soil to wither and die. And so sometimes when times are good, when there's no harsh sun, you don't know. It's what happens in the crisis. What do we learn from this parable number two? That we can't borrow from others. Verses eight to nine. The foolish ones then come to the wise and they say, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. And the wise ones say, no, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Some people struggle with this, but we need to understand that a parable is not meant to be pressed in every respect. This is not a parable about sharing. This is a parable about true faith. And these wise uh, bridesmaids know that if they're to share the oil, that there's not gonna be enough. Uh, the, the procession will be called off. There'll be darkness. The, the, there'll be no point in anyone going ahead. Jesus' point here is that you cannot borrow someone else's faith. You can't live off the experience of someone sitting next to you in worship this morning. Some husbands will boast about their wives who are doing precepts or Bible study and they'll say, well, that religion is at least in our home. That that should be enough to get us by. Or a wife says, well, I'm so glad my husband's a deacon and he's serving God. Uh, Maybe that's enough religion in our home to kind of keep us going. Doesn't matter who your gran was or your sister. Whenever I introduce myself to people, I hate it that they do this. Because I say hi and they ask what I do and I'm saying a pastor and immediately I get their long family lineage of who is remotely connected. Oh, really, Rosebank Union. My grandfather twice removed from his third cousin used to go to Rosebank Union Church, you know? And I, I would go there, you know, on weekends, but you know, it's just, it's, there's just these links. My own daughters can't rely on my faith. I can't rely on the fact that I just have a title pastor, that I'm ready. That doesn't make any sense if there's no reality of oil in my lives, you could be the Archbishop of Gauteng. That means nothing, it means nothing. Because Jesus is saying we each stand before the bridegroom as individuals, ready or not. The third sobering thing we learn from this parable is that there are no second chances, verse 10. Because while the unwise virgins were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived and the virgins who were ready went in with them to the wedding banquet and then we read these sobering and final words. And the door was shut. While they were gone doing something else, in that moment the groom came and the procession started and it was too late. Only those who had been part of the procession were allowed in. There's only a small window to witness a wedding and you can miss it. I think in my own ministry of a mother and a photographer who missed the wedding of her daughter. It was this really crummy venue. It was one of the first weddings that I ever did in Johannesburg. And today's weddings are often over the top and completely extravagant. This was the other extreme. It was just a restaurant. It wasn't even a proper venue and they were kind of like just spur tables and maybe 15 people and so on. And the mother was waiting eagerly with the photographer by this bridge across the river, waiting there. And the bride took some wrong turn and actually came at the back of the kitchen, walked through the kitchen, came out and we conducted the thing. Nobody in the party, the groom or, or his bride-to-be even noticed that her mother wasn't there, nor the photographer. Everything was done and dusted and she walked in and made a massive scene. You can imagine how hurt she felt. Where were you? And so you can miss a wedding because it's, it's just a small window. And when the door of opportunity is shut, it's, it's, it's shut. There was so much time up until this point to get ready. They weren't diligent and now it was too late. And Charles Spurgeon says, in all my searchings of the word, I have never found any kind of hope that the door once shut will ever be opened again. I wish there was some promise or hope of a second chance, but I don't see it in the scriptures and Spurgeon doesn't. That And this parable of our Lord says the door was shut and it was final. Was it not the bridesmaid's duty to accompany the bride and groom to his home? Didn't they have all night to get ready? Had he come early and they said, we weren't expecting you so early. Uh, I mean, we're not even dressed properly. No, he had come late. 
And Christ comes late in time. Even this morning, he has not come. He is coming late. We have all this time to be ready, but they missed the moment of marriage. They were late, they were unprepared. One pastor writes, I have to admit that I don't like this parable. And maybe you feel like that this morning. I said you'd be offended. I said you might feel judged as Christ holds up your life to the light of his word. This pastor says, I like most of the stories Jesus told. Most of the ones he told emphasize gracious invitations, offers of mercy, and that's the way the story starts. But then there are those words and the door was shut. That's so final. But Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this story too. There is an end to the window of opportunity and it comes at death or the second coming, whichever comes first for you, and there are no second chances then. That is why, brothers and sisters, and all of us that are listening, the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near because there will come a day when it will be too late. Today is our second chance. Today is the day of salvation. We have to prepare while the groom is still on his way. So what do we learn? We learn that the coming of the bridegroom reveals our true state. We learn we can't borrow from others. We learn that there are no second chances. Number four, we learn that his coming reveals our relationship with him. Verses 11 and 12. Later the others came Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. The unwise bridesmaids, by their lack of preparation, actually revealed their true heart condition that they didn't love the groom. They weren't concerned to be prepared. Terry Johnson describes the groom's words this way. I don't know you. I thought I did. I thought you cared about me. I thought you loved my bride. I thought you considered our wedding important, but clearly you don't, and I must conclude that I've misjudged who you are and misjudged our relationship. D.A. Carson, whom I hugely respect, says, Jesus' answer must not be construed as callous rejection of their lifelong desire to enter the kingdom. Instead, it is the rejection of those who, despite appearances, never made preparation for the coming of the kingdom. And then fifthly and finally, the final thing we learn, verse 13, we learn that we need to get ready. Get ready. Verse 13 says, therefore, keep watch. Therefore, in the light of this parable, keep watch, get ready, because you do not know the day or the hour. The beginning of chapter four in this whole section of parables, Jesus is saying, no one knows the day or the hour. And there's all sorts of crackpots out there that keep telling us, hey, I figured out with these numbers and these seasons when the day is. Well, I can say on the authority of the word of God, buy those books, open them, look at the dates, and then you can be absolutely guaranteed that that is not the date. Because Jesus says, no man, and that includes woman, no woman can know the day or the hour. No one, no one. So therefore you need to be ready. This is a state of readiness. I think of Amber, my eldest, who's gonna have a matric dance soon. She knows the date of a matric dance. So getting ready in that scenario is slightly different because she does know the date. There'd be something wrong with her if she did her hair in grade eight and her makeup in grade nine and got the boyfriend in grade 10 and did her nails in grade 11 and then waited. Because she knows the date, so she's just going to leave it until the week before and the night before and the day before and she's going to sort out the details. But we don't know. So the kind of readiness we need is a different kind of readiness. It's a state of readiness. Readiness at every time, like the thief in the night. Jesus said if you knew when the thief was coming, well then you would have clobbered him. But you don't. And so when you wake up, your stuff's gone. It's a state of readiness. Check the doors, check the locks, check the alarm, check the pit bulls, check everything. <laughs> You can counterfeit everything except a genuinely converted heart. Get ready. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. So I'm grateful that the word of God is holistic. There's some sermons that encourage us and the others that warn us. And we need sermons that challenge us to examine ourselves. And so I just want to end with three ways that you could examine yourself and, and give you some hope, give you some encouragement. 
Here's just three very brief ways that you can examine and what you should examine. Number one, examine your repentance. You wanna be sure that you don't, that you're not a hypocrite. So, so examine your repentance. Is there worldly sorrow or is there godly sorrow? The Apostle Paul uses those terms in 2 Corinthians, I think it's around about chapter six or seven, and I won't read that verse, but let me tell you the difference. Worldly sorrow looks so much like real repentance. It looks so much like godly sorrow, but you know what worldly sorrow feels sorry about? Me. It feels sorry that the consequences of sin have affected me. It, it feels sorry that now people think worse of me. It's actually just a form of self-pity. I've now been caught, like the young guy who was shoplifting out of incredible connection and came up to my office broken and weeping and crying because he'd stolen software and he is 17 or 18 years old. My parents have found out, now the police are coming, I'm gonna have a criminal record. He, he looked very remorseful and broken as any true repentant sinner, but it was because he was caught because there were consequences. It was still all about him. His repentance wasn't about God, it was about him. I can't believe I did this again. I'm, you know, I'm a better person than like this. Please don't judge me. Worldly sorrow is self-focused. It just says, okay, well, tomorrow I'll try and turn over a new leaf. It tries to, to, to get the lamp to work without the fuel of the gospel. It's to feel better about myself. Oh, I've asked for forgiveness. Now I feel better about myself. But godly sorrow repents because my sin has primarily grieved God. David in Psalm 51, Lord against you and you only have I sinned. No, David, you sinned against Bathsheba, her husband. No, but primarily I've broken God's heart. That's what's got to me. I recognize that I love God so much that my sin grieves him. That's why it bothers me. It bothers me because it first bothered him and sent Christ to the cross. When we come to this table, there's Christ on the cross dying for my sin. That's what my sin cost him. And godly repentance recognizes that when I sin, I'm saying I love this more than I love God. It's a love thing. Lord, I have broken your heart that I don't love you. I haven't just broken the rules of some cold and clinical judge and lawmaker. I've broken the heart of God. Godly sorrow is God-focused. It's broken that the glory of God has been tarnished, not primarily my reputation. Worldly sorrow is what Judas felt. Broken, weeping, remorseful, even seemed repentant, took those blood money coins and threw them back into the temple, but he was so self-focused, he still couldn't live with himself and he went out and committed suicide. That's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is Peter, outside also denying Christ, but he's broken, he's, he's weeping bitterly, and Christ restores him because his grief and his repentance was seen in time to be actually about Christ and not himself. Examine your repentance, that's how you get ready. Number two, examine your gospel. Are you trusting your good works or are you trusting Christ's good works? You are saved by good works, just not yours, Christ's. It's his work on the cross. Those who already look to Christ, and that's the joy this morning. The point of this message is not to say, you need to somehow get ready yourself. You cannot, you need the gospel, you need the oil. And it's given freely. If you're looking to yourself to be ready, you're gonna be horribly shocked and surprised on that day when you say, look at my good works, are they sufficient? And God says they're like a filthy rag that can't burn. Can you say with a hymn writer, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands. Could my zeal, no respite, no. Respite's an old word. Could my zeal never take a break even if I was so passionate and I had infinite, you know, super summer camp zeal that kept going on, even if my zeal for God, you know, didn't take a break, even if my tears could forever flow, the hymn writer says, and I was the most repentant person I know, the hymn writer says, could my zeal no respite, no, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone, thou must save and thou alone, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me saviour or I die. That's the joy this morning. It's just keep looking to Christ. Do you recognize that you need him more today than when you first became a Christian? Do you need him? Do you need the cross? Or do you say, well, that's, that was the, 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 the ABC of my Christianity. I've moved on to the X, Y, Z. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, lived a wretched life as a slave trader. It makes for a very horrific and interesting reading. 
if you knew what it was like in the 1700s, I think it was. Terrible life. And after becoming a Christian in the most dramatic way, I mean, that's why he wrote Amazing Grace, he saved a wretch like me. He says that Satan would often accuse him. Satan is the accuser who would dredge up his past, show him his sins, get him to doubt, maybe even say, you're a false convert, you're not a Christian. And you know what John Newton said? When Satan said, how can you claim to be a forgiven Christian? Newton says, what can I tell Satan? I cannot tell him that I'm a good man. I cannot tell him about my past or even my present. There is only one way of silencing him. I can face my fierce accuser and tell him, Christ has died for me and my sin. Christ has died for me. That's all we can say this morning. That's how you get ready. And then thirdly and finally, examine your love. Your love for Christ, your love for others is a duty or is it delight? A hypocrite obeys God to earn God's favor. Look at me, God, I'm in church again. Oh, I've missed the last few weeks. I'm feeling guilty. Better go again. I haven't been for a while. A hypocrite just wants to get God off their back. They just want to ease their conscience. Okay, at least now my conscience is not bothering me. You know, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. But a true believer delights. There's delight to do God's will. Their heart's been changed, so now there's a joy and a diligence. They're not doing it to earn God's favor. They already have God's favor. It's on our side of an overflow of God's love and his grace. Two people doing the same thing look the same, but one is doing it out of an overflow of God's love and the other one is doing it to earn God's love. One's a hypocrite, one is truly saved and in the gospel. Do you enjoy God? Is he your delight? Do you love reading his word? Do you love praying to him? Is he your, your treasure? Is he the pearl of great price? Do you enjoy worshiping him? Deep down you know that yes, there are times and struggles, but deep down I delight in God. Then look to Christ and just keep looking to him. As they held up the the cross in the desert, that, that pole, and they told them, look and be saved. So this morning just look to Christ and be saved. And so I close with these words from the Apostle Paul. When he came to the end of his life and he was wrestling, am I ready to face the groom? And he said, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He had no fear for the Lord, the righteous judge. He had peace, peace with God and the peace of God. And he says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. May we long for his appearing, Rose Bank, this morning, because we are ready to meet him. May it never be said that there were any in this gathering this morning that heard this parable, and yet on that day are surprised because they did not obey the Lord Jesus Christ and make him their delight. If you're not sure, then as you come to this table, Here's our second chance again to repent, to look to these elements, but ultimately to look to Christ. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we prepare our hearts now to receive this bread and this cup, Lord, we are reminded of what your word says, that a person ought to examine themselves before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Lord, we do not want to be any less prepared for this communion table than we are for your coming. You tell us that we need to celebrate this table only until you come again. And so we come before you now to confess our sins Lord, that in these moments as we spend time in quiet, as we come and kneel at the front, as we take these elements back to our seats, we just remind ourselves, Lord, that you know all things. You see us in truth and we just want to confess our sins and agree, agree with you about how you see us, apart from you and how you see us clothed in Christ's righteousness. And so, Lord, we don't want to run, we don't want to hide from you and we pray like the psalmist prayed, search our hearts and see if there's any offensive way in me. Forgive us for making you small, for doubting your power and your greatness. Lord, for placing our unbelief and limiting thoughts above the truth of who you are, for allowing the hardness of the world and our hearts and sin to overshadow your goodness and grace. 
Lord, forgive us for allowing the evil and suffering around us to cause us to doubt that you have a mighty arm, for allowing the broken world to drown out your goodness. Lord, we confess that we've allowed the complexities and the messiness of our lives to silence the fact that you're infinitely wise, Lord, and you know what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we have made you small, and in the process, we have become big, and the world has become big, and people who scoff at you have become seemingly invincible, and our problems have become huge, and challenges have become insurmountable. Oh Lord, won't you just show us your greatness and your beauty? Show us where we've set up a righteousness of our own instead of trusting the gospel and drive us back to the cross today. Help us to see our unrighteousness and then run to the Savior and to realize that there is a love offered to us here that is above every other kind of love, Lord. That, that if we are in Christ, there is nothing or no one that can pluck us out of your hand. Thank you that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and make us ready. Because we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.